Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, my good people. I'm so happy to see you here again on this Thursday. Uh, it's uh, Claude Granitsky here. I am the founder of True Africa University. I'm also an MIT Sloan alum, and I'm also a research affiliate at the Center for International Studies at MIT, which is our partner for this one wonderful webinar series we've been doing since 2021 in partnership with the MIT Africa Initiative. So every week uh, we have a different speaker who I uh, get to engage with. And I noticed that we haven't had as many leaders from the creative industries as I would have wanted. And so this week we have an incredible leader uh, from the creative industries, one of Africa's foremost artists, Kudza Naichirai is a Zimbabwean artist and activist. The activist part is really important because it's going to feed into today's conversation. He's well known for his paintings, his drawings, his videos and photographs that really started with uh, tackling and questioning some of the political choices that led to some of the social and cultural imbalances in his home country, Zimbabwe. He has been exhibited for the past 20 years in uh, some of the world's most prestigious museums, including MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Documenta in Castle, which is probably the most high profile art event anywhere. And one of the reasons I wanted to have him on this week's webinar is because when I met him in February in Johannesburg, we were introduced by a mutual friend, uh, Maria McCloy, who's also an activist based in Johannesburg. Uh, she had started Black Raid Productions back uh, about 20 years ago, actually, as well. Um, she told me about a project that Kuz and I was working on, which is essentially collecting these old vinyls, these old records that not just tell the story of African music, but also the story of African liberation. And that was really important to me as a cultural project coming from an important artist like Kudz and I, because one of the reasons I became uh, a trustee at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, PS1, and also at Mass Mocha Museum in Massachusetts is because one of my late uh, mentors, who I used to call a big brother, Okui and Wizor, had actually uh, taken me behind the scenes of an exhibition he had organized at the PS1 uh, Museum in New York uh, 20 years ago. And it was called the short century. And the short century was about independence and liberation movements in Africa between 1945 and 1994, which was the year of Nelson Mandela. And that landmark exhibition explored African culture through art, film, photography, architecture, music, literature, and theater. And I saw in Kudz and I a bit of an heir to Okwi, who is considered the greatest African curator of the past 30 years. And so in that one in a generation cultural statement, which was a short century, we see that the work that Kuzanai is doing now with his project, which he will tell you about, is in that lineage. And so with great honor and enthusiasm, I want to introduce to you Kuzanai Chirai, who will tell you about his project. Welcome Kuzanai. Um, thank you, Claude. Thank you for giving me this time. It was a pleasure to meet you in Joburg. And yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been amazing. So I will tell you about the, the project I've been working on, which is, it's called the Library of Things We Forgot to Remember. And it's, it started off as a, it started off essentially kind of as a, from an exhibition. They had an exhibition at the National Art Gallery of Zimbabwe in 2015. Yeah, 2015. And it was part of what I wanted to do is I wanted to incorporate um, an audio collection. So I'm almost like a, so, People can experience the exhibition um, through through I think, yeah through music and different kind of like audio audio elements. So I spoke to 
Mtoni, who from the Pan African Radio Station, I invited him to be part of the library and incorporate the Pan African Radio Station into the exhibition. So that was essentially where the library actually started. But before, before that, I think it was when I'd moved back to Zim, I'd become really interested in vinyls because I had friends who collected and friends who were DJs. So that was really interesting when I returned because I started to find vinyls at markets. Um, and then sort of my, my curiosity kind of grew from there. It's like, well, this is really interesting. Like the vinyls I was finding because there was a vinyl press and a record label that was in Bob. It's like, pretty much tried to buy as much as I can of the records that were pressed in, in Zimbabwe. But then it became really interesting was that I started to find vinyls that were, and recordings that were recorded in liberation camps in Mozambique and in Zambia. Now kind of like kind of piqued my interest. It's like, well, there's this something to this, because you find a particular language within, within, within all the vinyls. And this was really fascinating. So it then started this whole process like, well, what else can I then find that was related to the, the liberation struggle? And this then became like this really interesting dig process, like trying to find what else was available from Namibia? What else was available from Zambia, from Tanzania? What was pressed? Where was it pressed? Where can I find it? And this also was an interesting protest. So it was gathering all of those vinyls, whether buying them when I, when I, whenever I had an exhibition, I'll travel. And then I'd buy those vinyls that were available in, in Amsterdam, in Paris, and then bring them back. So this then also is like, well, if there's a particular language you're f I was finding within the vinyls, whether to do with protest, resistance, and activism, then it can't only be linked to Southern Africa. The process was continental and then essentially within the global South. So I started to expand the collection to, to Central Africa, to North Africa, to East Africa, to West Africa, and started to find really amazing vinyls and collections that had to do like Independence Day, Independence Protest, conferences, um, Black cultural festivals, theater productions. And these I started to find um, not only when I was in Zim or in South Africa, or additionally when I was traveling and also through friends who helped me um, find some of these records. So these then became the collection to which we installed at the National Art Gallery. So what you also see in the image in the slide is uh, the Pan-African radio station setting up. It had guests that they would bring in, they would have interviews or the kind of conversations that take place. And then this kind of like, um, started to grow within the program. They had a program of interviewing authors, writers, filmmakers, and even some of the musicians that were in the vinyl collection that we put up in the in the in the space of the National Art Gallery. So this became really interesting. It is like so it now became like an so almost like an incubation space. So what else is possible? And at this time I hadn't actually labeled, the library didn't have a name at the time. So it was also really interesting at some point when people came in to the exhibitions, like people started to speak about their memories about specific vinyls that were in the exhibition within the library and what connection they had to them. When was the first time they heard them? And it was really interesting because of that, because you started to have like intergenerational conversations that took place where parents would speak about, oh, I heard this vinyl at this place. And these were conversations parents didn't have with their kids. And in some 
where the library can like facilitate that process where um, this memory that had been kept almost kind of hidden or almost private was, was shared. Um, and I think that was really interesting. And what the library was able to do is like more of these conversations started to emerge um, throughout the duration of the exhibitions. Parents would bring their kids and some of the kids, it was the first time seeing vinyl. So it was like, they could now sit down, their parents would show them how to use the vinyl player and then they could listen together. And then the, these stories were now being shared. So this then became how I started to think about the collection itself and the library was like, well, these are things we forgot to remember. And that's essentially where the title or the name of the library came from, the library of things we forgot to remember. But then this library became, it being like a incubation space to try out specific ideas. It was also like, well, since this also can be mobile, it became, well, this can be a traveling library, um, a traveling audio library, which can be installed in different spaces to further engage or further broaden kind of conversations about the liberation struggle, about protest, about um, uh, protest, um, activism and collaboration. So then that became the way the library, I think, started to grow its legs and started to find or being invited to different spaces for the library to be, to be installed. So I think one of the, on the following side, I think after Zim, we, we went to, we're invited to the Paris by Marianne Yemsi and to install the library where Kanya became our librarian. And one of the interesting things I started to doing is like, well, as part of this, this library and it being a library, I think it's important that we work with a librarian instead of working with a curator. Because I think it, it required a very different approach to, to what the library holds. And I think at this time, we had kind of, I think throughout the years, since, since the first one, I'd bought not only an audio collection, but then I started to add an art collection to the library. And this collection in some way responded to the vinyl collection or to the audio collection that we had. And then through that process, I, I also was able to find um, posters that were printed in the 60s, 70s, 80s from political parties, um, WPF, um, ANC, PAC, and even political pamphlets that were produced during that time. So it became this collection that spoke to each other, um, audio and visually. So with every librarian that we work with, they make a specific selection, they put together a program, a talks program that went with the library installation. And then the conversations begin, I think the same conversations, what is protest, what is activism, what is collaboration, and how are, the, how are they all linked um, to our present day lives and how our present day lives are linked to the past. So it was like this really interesting way of bringing the past into the present and trying to find ways where there's commonality, but then this also try and find points where there's difference and what those differences mean today and how those differences we can use um, in, our, in our lives. So this became one of the ways we, we started to create programs within the library space around conversations, around protest, around activism, about collaboration, what all of these things meant that were also present in the vinyl collection and what it then means to us today. So with time, it became a really interesting process because the same kind of conversations about memory also emerges whenever the library travels. And it was also really interesting that the, the library was in Paris because 
the reference points will also be different in terms of language, political history um, in that space. So that ivory then becomes something really interesting because it's central ideas and central focus point around protest, um, collaboration and resistance. Having the library in, in a different location means you, you're bringing those thoughts and those conversations to the space in the same way, like you would kind of consider what a liberated zone was. So in some thinking and in some, some of the conversations, the library would kind of be considered as like a liberated zone where politicizations, conversations, um, education, and what that meant in the liberated zones, we were also starting to interrogate and experience wherever the library was installed. So this became really interesting. So whenever we traveled, these became integral features of the library where we almost kind of like considered it as, as like a, as a liberated zone in some sense. And what that will mean within a private institution and what kind of conversations emerge from those spaces. So you, you'll see like from the next slide, like um, the conversations we're having and was through like the programming from my NMC that the library became a central space within the exhibition to have performances, to have listening sessions where DJs would come in and create soundscapes based on the collection itself. And, and it was really interesting because you'd have kind of queer perspectives on sound that were part of the listening sessions, Pan-African perspectives um, that were part of the listening session. So it was really broad and really inclusive. We're trying to be really broad and inclusive in, in the listening sessions um, that we kind of put together uh, for the library. So this then becomes, I think, and it, yeah, like from the first um, installation, almost like an incubation space, how do we explore these ideas about protest, collaboration, resistance, which we are reshaping now, when some way kind of like remixing now within our everyday experiences. So the library then becomes this kind of really interesting instrument in, in some way for exploring those ideas. Um, so the library then kind of continues to grow and continues to travel um, throughout um, its existence. I think the next slide will be our next, will be this was from an installation we had in Malmo, Sweden. And it was also through um, a conversation I had with like a, an amazing curator, Tanda Apia. Um, through him, I guess like we kind of worked kind of co, as kind of co-librarians in some sense. And this was one, one of the kind of like installations that we had and exploring kind of like the vision audio language of of, from the vinyls. So apart from having like a vinyl collection, we also have like a, a digital, a digitized um, collection. And it was also important that we found ways of um, exploring these conversations, um, expanding on these conversations. And I think the library has been able to find I think collaborators um, and institutions who have afforded us like the space to do that. And I think um, with talent, it was amazing um, from film screens, from um, exchanges, from um, guest DJs coming come to the space. And I think it was kind of like the conversations that you find in the on audio, audio collections that were taking place in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I think became present within the spaces that the library was, was being hosted in. So I think that was also really integral um, as to what the library meant and what it should be doing. And I think 
the kind of spaces it has created and the kind of incubation of ideas and ex exploration, I think, has been really amazing um, during this protest, process. So one of the things I think I had to then essentially do was, apart from having a traveling library, was after a while, I, I found a permanent space for the library, which is in Joburg. And that was, the, that was like an amazing opportunity to then say, well, we can create, since the library can travel, we can create a program within a physical space that is kind of ongoing and exploratory um, based upon the collection and even like with collaborations um, within the space itself. Like, so that was really, really amazing, like how we set that up and primarily kind of like hinging around um, protest, collaboration, resistance and how how we found that within like our collaborators was was really amazing room 19 as one of our collaborators i think was um phenomenal um we had like one of my favorite kind of like artists um Nolan Den dennis also like his diagram became i think the foundation of something that was amazing because our collaborators kind of fed off um, his diagram and that kind of fed other kind of like exploratory processes that emerged um, during that installation. And we even had like talks that kind of followed, um, I think in the next slide, you would see like some of the um, flyers from those conversations, which were hosted by um, Le Bohan, and she put together like an amazing program where we were able to combine our audio collection with some of the collection became part of the conversation. So it was almost like uh, a, call and, a call and response where conversations around, around love, land, redemption were then also those conversations were also explored within the vinyl collection that we had. So that was also one of the ways to explore the audio collection as part of um, the library's engagement. So it's, it's always been like, I guess for us it's always been like an important, like how do we find ways to integrate um, the library into everything that we do within the collection. So it's not also like, like a static, um, like a static audio, like a like a static vinyl collection, like in the space itself, you're able to come in, select a vinyl, sit down, and and listen and spend a day listening to what we have. And this kind of doesn't limit it to say like um, you can be nine years old, you can be like ninety five, and the space is kind of open to to come and sit down and listen to. To, a vine, to the vinyl collection. So I think that was always kind of really important um, within the library's development and how we wanted to engage with everyone. So thank you for giving us this overview because I this has been absolutely fascinating. I wanna talk a little bit more about what you said about bringing the past into the present because that's what even much been the arc of my own trajectory, professional trajectory and personal quest. You know, I used to publish a magazine and I launched a TV network called Trace and the magazine was very much about tracing it back. So I've always been obsessed with how we came to be who we are today and the history that underlies some of the choices that were made politically, socially, economically, so that Africa is in the state that it's in today and Africans are living the life they're living today. And when I went uh, to your studio in, 44 Stanley in Johannesburg, I took a few photos, which I'm gonna share uh, mm -hmm. right now uh, with this audience. And I want you to comment on a couple of them because you know, uh, you know, the pictures that we saw earlier, we couldn't really zoom in. So I'm just gonna uh, flip and just show you some that were particularly interesting to me. So this yeah. is the great Taboule with the singer Mbidia Bell who was starting out. Uh, this is Morogoro Jazz. Um, 
um, you know, which is again, I'm sort of researching what that means. The Apala groups in Nigeria uh, from 1967 and 19, to 1970, uh, the heavenly Ethiopic, you know, that then, you know, people started hearing about a little bit later. And um, what was interesting to me, I stopped and asked you about this. Uh, Malcolm mm -hmm. X speaks of the people in Harlem. And mm -hmm. um, what was interesting to me in looking at that and looking at uh, the great March to Freedom, Reverend Martin Luther King uh, speaking in Detroit in, on June 23rd, 1963, is again, a lot of people from my generation and even from the younger generation of millennials and Gen Z, they don't know how much the African liberation movement was supported by leading civil rights activists in the United States. A lot of people don't know that Martin Luther King went to the inauguration of Kwame Nkrumah in 1957 when Ghana became the first Black Republic in Africa. And so I wanted to ask you how you feel about these links between the, well, the liberation movement in Africa as documented in these vinyl and perhaps the struggle for civil rights in the United States? Um, I think they're all integral and I think essentially linked because I think one of the things you find during that particular time is it was, it was essentially all about survival, like how, how are Black people going to survive? How are we going to survive that time? How were they surviving? that violent period. And I think it is also important to understand it's like you couldn't do it alone. You couldn't do it in an isolated, you couldn't do it as an island. I think for me, I think it was essential that they all spoke to each other. They all met, they all congregated in specific spaces. So it's one, like the thread of one idea you could find from Zim to Mozambique, to Guinea-Bissau, to Conakry, to Senegal, to Ghana, to, to Cuba, to Salvador Bahia, to the US. It was an essential, it was an essential web where ideas traveled. It was, it was almost like the internet of their time where they were able to connect and it's like, these conversations were not hap happening in, in, in isolation. So it became fundamental that um, the American civil rights, civil rights movement spoke to kind of like and hosted liberation parties, the PAC, the ANC, ZAPU. And I think there was like the Black Congressional Caucus, I think that I think in some way connected all of these things and enabled like um, these conversations to take place. So I think it's, it's, it's never to think like their blackness, their sense of survival, their requirements for one man, one, one man, one vote we were not isolated. I think they were part of a, a much broader um, fight at play. So I think it's, it's, I think that that is often kind of like underestimated in terms of how um, all of it is essentially connected. And I think the, if we don't speak about that, we fail to then speak to each other today because like there's a roadmap that was already set up for us in the 60s and 70s by them. And if you can't use it today, then that history becomes irrelevant. Then we're almost trying to like trying to invent the wheel where those kind of structures are already set up. So I think it's important to always revisit that. It's important to always ask those questions like why aren't we speaking to each other? Why do we have to wait for a tragic event for us to then have that conversation? So for me, I think it's important. Like I think in some way, I think we kind of I think in one generation, they don't remember it or they're not aware of it. But then in the generation before them, if it was their parents, 
they remember those conversations that took place. I think so many of my grandparents um, are in the States, are in Washington. Um, and people, I think, who in the 60s, 70s left um, to go in exile from um, South Africa, from Zimbabwe, ended up in the US. So they, they were like, connections that were taking place, they were, Ameri they were at American universities and engaged in kind of like um, the sort of activities taking place. So they even um, were aware of what was happening in Zim through their presence in the US. But I think it's, there's a kind of generational divide where in some sense, like what our parents knew and experienced we don't speak about as much or that kind of generation conversation hasn't taken place. So one generation I think lives and survives today, the other generation lived and survived, but then that conversation hasn't taken place. Like yeah, how then do we survive this process together? So I wanted to show a few more um, uh, covers of these vinyls that I took when I was in your studio there's, there's in Johannesburg. There's one other thing I have to say about those vinyls is that mm -hmm. all of the vinyls you've shown, most of them I didn't buy in South Africa or in Zim. I literally had to buy them outside of the country. Most of them I had to buy to you buy in Europe. And it's 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 very significant because even for my work, when I reference the library, when I work on my film, and there's a particular sound I'm looking for and I want to sample, the likelihood that I have to, I have to travel to Europe to listen to those vinyls became an issue for me. It's like, why should I be doing that? Why should I travel all the way to Europe? Most of this music and these recordings were essentially made on the continent. Why is that? Why is that? Why do I have to do that? So for me, it became interesting within the process. It's almost like trying to repatriate these sounds, these recordings, these conversations, these dialogues that took place in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then have them in a place where you don't have to travel anymore. You don't have to get into a plane to travel to Europe to um, to listen to some of what we have in the collections. Like, it's right there in Johannesburg. Um, so that for me was also really important, but it's just like, it, I think it kind of goes back to the, the broader issues. Like if the access to this material is only localized in Europe, what, what does that mean about our own archival system, our own archives essentially? Um, what does it mean for that? for that record. And even when you look at gen, gen, generators, gen Z, what would it mean for them? Especially, even if you're looking at Gen Z in South Africa, what would it mean for them if that archive is not present um, for them to, to engage with? So, so that's the one thing I, I had to kind of like bring into the conversation in regards to the records we were showing that a lot of them had to buy in Europe. I, I, I get it, and it's perhaps a way of reappropriating what was appropriated in the past in Europe and elsewhere, right? And you also, some of these prices were shown in dollars, so that assumes that perhaps it was bought in the United States when these are cultural productions, cultural industries that should have actually created wealth and, and consciousness on the African continent. And so that's why I wanted to share maybe a couple more of, mm -hmm. of these uh, vinyls and um, because they say so much, they tell so many stories about where we've come from and where we're going. And this one is really interesting, right? The Congo Republic, Leopoldville and Rwanda. And then you go from here to, okay, um, uh, uh, you know, Thomas Mafumo and Black Sun Limited. Again, Chimurenga Variety is very, very important artist. And, mm -hmm. and then you go, and this is where I wanted to stop for a second the songs from Roadside in Rhodesia. And, and then you have the map of Rhodesia. And the reason this one was so interesting to me and I was so intrigued by it was because, you know, your country, Zimbabwe, used to be known as Rhodesia. And, 
and it was not ever really a recognized date, but that is pretty much what Zimbabwe used to be. And last week in our webinar, we had an activist from South Africa, from Joburg, who was talking about the Fees Must Fall movement and how um, students knocked down and, and defaced the statue of Cecil Rhodes, right, who gave, gave his name to Rhodesia. And, and this new reappropriation, this new consciousness, I believe that projects like yours really help to elevate the dialogue because it shows people what actually happened. And when you see an image such as the image that's on the cover of that vinyl around Rhodesia, how, what does it say to you as somebody who's from Zimbabwe? Um, I guess it means like things have changed. Um, that was Rhodesia, we live in Zimbabwe now. But I think it's also, but change doesn't always come in the way that we imagine it to be. So we always have to become like, be very kind of critical of change and what change means and what we expect of it. So I think that process is also really interesting. I think with, with my generation as to fees must fall, roads must fall, and what that has meant for, I think that kind of political consciousness, but it's also like, what does it mean kind of going forward? What does it mean in, what will it mean? Because it was very interesting. I remember when the Fees Must Fall protest started, um, I was in Brazil, Salvador Bahia. And what was amazing was that the very same conversation was taking place. Um, and I think it related to what was going on in Brazilian universities. Um, but then one of the things I remember, and it was kind of very distinct, was that the students at, I think it was the university in Salvador, weren't able to speak to the university in Cape Town. So there was also almost like, we are, we are going through the same experience, we're experiencing kind of like the same kind of change, but then we are not speaking to each other in any way. We are not kind of, creating these important webs of ideas that are without borders. It's like, yes, we are having this particular conversation, but then we are localizing it to South Africa. We are localizing it to Zimbabwe. We are localizing it to, to Salvador. We are localizing it. So there's almost like these kind of barriers and borders almost erected around what we're experiencing and what we're trying to survive and what we're trying to achieve. So for me, it was an important point, or it was an important kind of like um, highlight that we are not speaking to each other. We are trying to survive our political institutions. We're trying to survive um corporations we're trying to survive our states but then we're trying we're surviving it alone and quietly alone yes we we vocalize within um our locations but then we're almost kind of doing it quietly because we are not speaking to other people who are affected or experiencing the same things so for me going back to what you're saying about fees must fall rose must fall it's like that conversation, I think in some way, we need to find a way that, that links in the same way, like the, the geriatrists from the 60s, 90s, the 80s, were all speaking to each other across the continent, from Senegal to Dar es Salaam, to Accra, to Conakry, to Guinea-Bissau, to Mozambique. They were all speaking to each other. So there's almost like, we find ourselves in a generation where yes, there is Twitter within, 
there's all these platforms, but then there's almost like a barrier to how we can engage with each other's conversations. So yeah, it's kind of getting back to yeah, what you're saying about seasons four. I think that for me, I think kind of bringing it forward is like in some way we still don't, but then we still do when I think like Black Lives Matter, um, when we speak about that, it, we do speak about it, but it's like, well, it can also be different. Like I live in a majority black country. So how do I also think around Black Lives Matter? And how do you have the conversation with the US in regard to Black Lives Matter when it comes to like Zimbabweans or South Africans? So it's, I think that's an important conversation to have because now you're crossing borders, you're making almost like, it's not bound to a country and it becomes far more broader. And I think it's far more enriching that when that takes place. Yeah, I actually discussed this on my weekly Limitless Africa podcast. I had an episode called Does Black Lives Matter to Africa? And it was really interesting to have three voices uh, of Africans um, commenting on the Black Lives Matter movement. But I wanted to go back to Fees Must Fall, and I put a link there in the chat, because mm -hmm. for those who missed the webinar that we had last week with Busi Siwe Seabi, one of the leaders of that movement, it was a student-led protest movement that was really started around October 2015. And the idea was to stop increases in student fees, tuition fees, and also to increase government funding for universities. Uh, and then it led to an entire debate around inequality in, in, in South Africa. But I wanna now take it to a question from Kyle Marston. And Kyle is asking, when it comes to this exploration of African vinyls, and I imagine maybe even cassettes, I, I don't know if anyone really knows what a cassette is anymore, but some of, of, of us do. What kinds of linguistic trends do you see? Were there specific styles of music that were more likely to be done in a colonial language instead of a native language? What role did music play in spreading languages like Koza or Twi or Ethiopian? I, I would imagine Kyle means Amharic. Um. Oh, that's a, that's tough one. Because like it's a really difficult one, yeah. Because I'm not a particular I'm not a particularly specialist on that. Um, but I think there's something to be said for when a cultural output such as which is which is sound can travel and find its way through a continent, whether it's through the particular musicians themselves or through cultural groups. Like, for example, like you'd find one, like at a particular time, a particular sound can find roots within a particular movement, like a political movement. And then that is then kind of, it travels through political organization, can travel through cultural festivals, and then at some point it can become part of pop music in some sense. So that's one way of kind of looking at it, um, especially with the vinyls and the, the collection that we have. With what you're asking about is like, that um, I, I wouldn't particularly be sure, but I wouldn't want to like answer a question that I'm not a specialist in. So I would rather, the stuff that I was kind of familiar with within the library was like, these political ideas traveled through sound, through cultural festivals, through um, political groups and particular cultural production that were linked to political movements. And these particular sounds found roots and spaces to exist in other spaces. And they, that then became kind of like the popularization of um, particular guitar riffs or particular sound or particular melody in some way. So for me, I think that for me, 
would be something I could refer to within the Lagos collection itself. To the other things that you refer to, it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not a particular specialist for that. So I wouldn't be able to answer you in a way that um, would make sense. Um, so yeah, it's like, as you got to the library, yes, um, there are ways that music kind of moved politically, but to the other kind of like language and ling linguistic elements, like I wouldn't really be sure as to that process and to answer you like in a way that makes um, sense. Well, I think you've been really helpful in the way that you've helped us to dissect this. I wanna turn it over now to an MIT student, um, I mean, Yona Bossman, who will ask you a question before I come back uh, for my final question uh, ahead of wrapping up. So, I mean, Yona, you uh, please introduce yourself before you ask your question. It'd be great for the entire audience to know what you do. Hi, I am Amin Yona Bosman. I am a first year graduate student at MIT. I'm studying in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, I do work with the community on um, just social things around Boston. I'm a Boston resident. And I also have a construction company and I'm interested in creating uh, you know, healthy healing spaces around the community. So I'm glad, Claude, that you brought up the connection between um, like Dr. Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, because I was thinking when I saw some of the uh, students sitting in the library, and I, first of all, that library is awesome to just things that we forgot to remember. That's so important. But it started, all these questions came in, so I'll try to stick with one. Um, one of them was basically, how are we connecting that history? Because you have so much history, but there's not too much sequence. Well, I'm not sure. So my question is like, is there a sequence and sharing? Um, this is Mahatma Gandhi and Mahatma Gandhi inspired Dr. Martin Luther King's civil, civil disobedience protest. And, and we are very linked. And when um, the US went to war with Iraq, like the nations, right, stood up against it. And then like even today with the Black Lives Matter and all of the murders here against black men, you've got um, the song like, don't shoot, hands up, don't shoot. And there's a lot of artists. And I'm just wondering like, I, th I, I love the fact that this is a traveling library. Is there any way that you or the library, the organization is trying to keep the narrative and the, and the history going? Because as African people, we use words, we use drums, we use music to communicate. So this is also just our regular historical traditions, right? That we, we consistently do. So is there any way that your library is able to travel into other countries with other artists to have this dialogue and to say, we have to continue this legacy of supporting one another through these movements? Yeah. Well, the library, we, the library kind of like part of what we have done is that the library is constantly traveling. Um, so it's been to Sweden a couple of times, it's been to Cape Town. Um, so, Yes, wherever there's space, whenever there's an invitation, we try and make the library available. And I think it's always really interesting because wherever we install it, whether we have a librarian from that specific city or who's familiar with that city, then kind of brings in the different kind of social engagements that are important to that city. So that's one of the ways that we do it. So the installation, for example, in Malmo, Sweden was very important for, for Malmo because it, it, it looked at the community, like what was happening within the community, what sense of memory that community has, and then decided to bring it into the library, decided to kind of provide broader engagement um, about diversity, about equality, about immigration and immigration rights, and brought all of that within, within to the library. So I think for us, it's been really interesting. It's like wherever we installed it, wherever we've got an invitation, is to then work with a librarian 
who is a guest and then provides almost like this map of how do we then create, make the library a community center in some way? And what conversations can we have about, about history and memory? And how do we remember it? remember it and how should we remember it and how what tools can we use to remember the past but then so, so with those tools how then do we kind of like imagine a future like what will that future look like how then can this history this audio history these conversations these dialogues the sense of imagination how can it be part of our future so that's essentially what the library does. And we, wherever we are invited to, like we start, we look at it that way and trying to find ways that turning an exhibition space, which the library is installed in, turning that into a community center. Okay, that sounds good. Um, are you going to include any like art? Because the vinyl itself is art and the yeah. music but any type of like murals or different art that was a part of the movement that did not or wasn't associated with any music? So what I've done is that I think over the years, I've bought like an art collection for the, for the library. And the art collection um, also responds to the, in some way has a conversation with the, the vinyl collection. So whenever we've, we have put up the, the library and the vinyl collection, the library's art collection also travels. So the librarian will, will select a photograph, will select a painting, um, will select a sculpture, and then that also kind of travels with the library. So the library has its own art collection that's part of the, um, the light whenever it travels. So, it's, so there's also those conversations that are part of the the collection or the installation. Do you feel like you uh, the library has received a, enough exposure? Like our communities from different countries reaching out to you. Um, have you heard from any artists that are political artists that are interested in participating or even sharing or presenting? And is there any communication that you're trying to create for that to happen? We've, we've always, um, like, it's, it's sometimes kind of like, it, it's always weird because you sometimes you always kind of like think of exposure as a way of getting people in. I think sometimes even the idea of like word of mouth, like, oh, did you go to this library is sometimes sufficient um, as to say the library is present. I think for me, it's like, that is probably one of the, the best things to have taken place that people speak to it and say it's like, oh, this library exists for this reason. I think it's also, it's an interesting space um, in that we also then host other institutions within the library. Like we've worked with UJ and we've hosted some of their conversations, University of Johannesburg. Um, we've worked with VITS, we've worked with the Goethe Institute, we've worked with this collective called um, Umklavati, we've worked with Room 19. Um, so throughout, I think, the life of the library, we've kind of sought specific conversations or sought, I think, um, artists, authors, writers, architects, who found something within the library they can engage with, something within the library's language that they're familiar with and found important to have a discussion about. So for me, I think that has been its success. And I think throughout the period, we've had like international guests, um, Tina Camp, an amazing um, academic from the US. She's been to our space and was through like a UJ program that we hosted it. And I think that process has kind of created kind of, I guess, exposure. But then like, we don't particularly try, seek out particular engagements because it's like, 
it's a self-run space. We have a limited budget. So we also have to be really creative in terms of what we bring into the space, the kind of com conversations we have and say, well, can we afford it? Can we afford to do this? Um, so we're at time. I'm sorry, unfortunately, I have to cut you off. I want to thank you, Kuza Naichirai, for a really interesting discussion on the culture, on the identity, and perhaps on the future of Africa. I want to invite everybody back next uh, Thursday, one week from now, and we will have a discussion on May 11th, same 12 p.m. Eastern time, Boston time. And the discussion will be with Obi Ezekwesili, who was a former minister of education in Nigeria, who was also the head of uh, the Africa region for the World Bank and a former presidential candidate in Nigeria. And she will be talking about what can Africa's future leaders do to transform the continent. So all pretty much in continuity with this conversation. Thank you all for coming. Have a great evening. Have a great morning. Have a great afternoon, depending where you are. And thank you for tuning in. See you next Thursday. Bye. Mm -hmm.